great. We will call the August 4th PCI committee meeting to order. Um, and start with our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, of America and to the Republic which stands, stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight's nice meeting is our regularly scheduled committee meeting. In order to meet the requirements of the Pennsylvania Sunshine Law, it is necessary to record the names of all citizens who speak to the committee during the meeting. To assure compliance with this requirement, it is essential that those planning to address the committee state their name and, ad and address. Members of the audience are asked to limit their questions and comments to no more than five minutes. This limit will permit time for all those who wish to speak to the committee. Whenever members of the audience exceed this time limit, the committee chair may ask the individual to yield to the next speaker. We will have public comment for 30 minutes at the beginning of ECI this evening, and there will be an email available for anyone who wishes to comment beyond the 30 minutes. Um, following the um, uh, a motion for approval of our minutes, we will move into public comment. So can I have a motion to approve the minutes from our last meeting? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Misty, just a, a point of clarification. Did you say that it's a five minute uh, opportunity to speak? Um, no, I don't. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought for some reason I thought you served it because I, I don't, I don't agree believe so more people can have the opportunity to speak in a 30 minute. No, no, I said that just a point of clarification we will have 30 minutes total for um, public comment this evening at the beginning of the meeting. Anyone who wishes to speak beyond that or wishes to comment beyond that, there will be an email of an email available that you can send your comments to. Okay, I think I might've just heard something wrong there. <laughs> <laughs> no, so we will use our regular timer for each person. So um, you'll see the timer come up on the screen um, for anyone wishing to comment. So, Mr. Gilmore, when you are ready, um, we can move into public comment. Alrighty, folks, for the public comment tonight, uh, if you'd like to make public, public comment, uh, please raise your blue hand in the interface. Uh, once you pop up there, I will activate your mic and uh, you can begin your comments. Mr. Luby is up first. Mr. Luby, your mic is open. Corey, you're ready to go as soon as you unmute. Corey Luby, 114 Knollwood Drive, Lansdale, PA. My comment is a disappointment with the board's decision, decision last week to vote 9-0 for the school to go completely virtual. You all um, sided with the minority, 14 to 16% as my numbers have it. I, I did ask for those numbers and I did not receive those. Leaving 84 to 86% who selected either to go all in person or go virtual, we are left without any option. We as parents knew the risk. We selected those options. Nobody was forced to make those options. Furthermore, I don't think our teachers have the experience or have been instructed to teach in a virtual environment. Our students haven't been taught how to learn in a virtual environment. And sitting in front of a computer for hours on end, listening to somebody is difficult. It's much easier said than done. But I'll leave you all with this. Next time before you jump to a vote, understand where the majority is in your district, put together a quick think tank and come up with solutions. As some of us have been in this boat before and are currently in this boat, and have many, many options that we could help and assist our assistant superintendents, Dr. Bauer, Dr. Rufo, and get our district and our students back in school. Thank you. Okay, if there's any other comments for tonight, please raise your hand in the interface. It's a little blue hand if you're looking for the hand, it's down at the bottom there. Okay, Mrs. G, uh, William Hellman is up next. William, I'm opening up your mic. Um, once you're ready, unmute your mic and um, begin your comments. 
Hi, yes, this is William Hellman, 709 Springhouse Court. I just want to echo what Corey said. The school board took the decision away from the parents. You had already committed by asking us to commit whether or not in-person education was going to be an option. I, I agree with what Corey said, that the teachers are unprepared and unlikely to be prepared to provide a fully virtual learning opportunity that is even close to what the students would have in person. And I'm concerned that other extracurricular activities may also suffer a reversal of board approval in that sports or band or any number of other outside of the core classes activities would also be lost, further hurting our students from scholarship opportunities that may be lost due to not competing this year and education that's lost by not being in person in class. It, the board needs to reconsider its vote from Thursday and return the choice to the parents who have the requirement responsibility to assess that risk on each of our students' behalf. It is not the board's responsibility to assess that risk for me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, are there any more comments for tonight's um, public comment portion of the meeting? Okay, uh, Mrs. G, there are no other blue hands that are currently up. Hold on. Um, hand popped up and went away. Just wanna make sure that they'd still like to make. Todd Miller, if you wanted to make a comment, you need to raise your hand for me again. Okay, here we go. Uh, Mr. Miller is up next. When you're ready to begin talking, your mic is unmuted. Mr. Miller, you have to make sure your mic is unmuted. There you go. Hi, my name is Todd Miller, 117 Shannon Drive, North Wales, Pennsylvania. I've written a couple of emails and I just wish everybody well, uh, the board and, and the kids in the district. I'm just concerned because I thought that the school board meeting that we just had was just a perfunctory um, process where the school board, um, you know, met and they had their decision made. And my feeling is that um, why have public commentary if the school board is actually not going to respect and take into consideration any of the comments that were made. I remember listening to a nurse who was very articulate about wanting the school um, kids to come back to, to school and uh, poured her heart out. And I just thought, why, if it's a perfunctory process, have any comments at all if they're not going to be listened to and <clears throat> my main comment is that um, you know I am a licensed uh, social worker and I work with um, kids that are suicidal and I was really concerned with the lack of appreciation for the mental health processes um, in our district and, and people in, in, on the school board thinking that it's just a socialization issue and it really missed the mark. There are kids suffering and I talk to them every day and there's no appreciation for what the pain and anguish that these kids are feeling. And I'm concerned about the mental health issues of our kids in the district. And there seems to be a total lack of appreciation and just a 
sort of, you know, adherence just to the, the teachers union. I know the teachers work hard, but I think we can't put the teachers union above the, the kids in our district. Thank you very much. Okay, up next is Lauren Wilson. Lauren, uh, we've given you permission to talk. You can unmute your mic and begin your comments. Okay, thanks. So I, I just was gonna say, um, listening to the other calls, I just wanted to part the other side of the spectrum and I felt like the last meeting was super um, um, impactful to me. Um, I felt like the, the entire board you, um, led with the data. Um, I heard a lot of concern about um, mental health and a lot of different consideration points that I as a parent hadn't even thought of or, or even considered when thinking about sending my child back to school. And so, you know, I just wanted to provide the other side of the coin and just say how proud I am of the district for all of the plans that were put in place. Um, and then how proud I am of the, the board for standing in the pocket and doing what's right in the face of, um, you know, all that there is going on. And so um, thank you all for, for the district. Thank you to the board. I think our students' safety is evident um, that that's everyone's um, top priority. And so um, I'm looking forward to hearing about how we can do our best from a virtual learning perspective. Um, from myself as a parent and then um, from the district's perspective as well. So thank you. Okay, if there are any other comments, uh, you would raise your hand now. Mrs. G, that looks like that's it for public comment tonight. There are no more hands in the interface and um, I'm talking slowly, so if a hand pops up, I think we're good. There are no hands up. Okay, great. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who did um, make public comment and the emails that we've received. Please know that we actually do read all of the emails, listen to public comment, and um, really try to be mindful of our entire school community. So thank you to everyone who is paying attention and emailing and um, calling in for public comment. We definitely do appreciate it. Um, so now we will move on to adoption of novels, which I believe is, um, is, is that Rachel and Deanna are going to be? Okay, you're on. Hi, um, good evening everybody. Um, so we were here in March and in March we presented um, a novel that we were adopting as well as the new African American Studies course. And we want to today just present um, some new novels that we'd like to adopt in grades seven to 10 um, as we continue our cultural proficiency and equity efforts. And also because um, in order to be successful virtually, we are gonna need to purchase some new novels for the 2021 school year. So before I go ahead and uh, share a little bit about the novels that we're hoping to adopt, I also want to mention um, as well as, you know, purchasing these novels and continuing to make sure that we have diverse novels um, at all levels, we also are going to be collapsing levels um, in um, social studies and also in English. So we will um, be collapsing the 4.0 classes and um, this year these novels will be for, you know, both the 5.0 and 6.0 students. Um, so, moving to what the novels we are hoping to adopt. Um, the first one is in grade seven. And, um, okay, you can actually go to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so the first one is grade seven. This is called The Crossover. Um, in this story, um, it's about a teenage boy and his twin brother with the support of their father. These boys are really excited about the basketball season and potentially winning a championship. And in the story, it kind of takes a turn um, where it involves a health issue, relationships with other classmates. And then this, it's really about, you know, the brother um, losing and then finding his way. So it kind of ends on a positive. Um, we also are hoping to adopt in grade seven, Never Caught. Uh, by Dr. Erica Dunbar. And this is a real powerful story about a woman who risked it all to gain freedom. 
from one of our nation's founding fathers. In ninth grade, we're looking to adopt a book called Brown Girl Dreaming. And this is an award-winning uh, book also where the author shares her childhood as an African-American growing up in the 60s and 70s during the height of the civil rights movement. And the last book that we're looking to adopt in our grade 10 world literature course is The Alchemist. And this book is a book about self-discovery. It's a boy named Santiago, and he's basically um, on a quest that leads him to riches and a more satisfying uh, world than he ever dreamed of. So again, um, we really are looking to continue our work in our cultural proficiency and equity efforts. Um, we had a committee working on doing this um, this school year, and unfortunately, during the closure, um, they did not get to uh, kind of finish what they started, but the English teachers have been doing a lot of work over the summer um, under the direction of Mrs. Early, and they've been working really hard to kind of prepare for this virtual environment. Um, also, a couple of these books align um, really nicely to the social studies curriculum um, in which the students um, take as well. So um, we're, like I said, are hoping that these books will be adopted tonight, and then we'd like to come back in September to talk a little bit more about um, a book change in grade 11. Um, for that grade, we're reaching out. We've already reached out to a couple of other school districts to see what they're using. We've also reached out to um, some sorority members, an African-American sorority full of educators um, who have um, on social media share a lot of ideas. And so some great novels have been shared there. And so we're looking at those as well. Um, and what we'd like to do is after we kind of generate that list, um, run that by our teachers um, and see, you know, get their thoughts, of course, and then come back to you in September um, for that as well. So those are the novels um, tonight that we're hoping to consider. Are there any questions from the committee members? Um, I, I will just say that I appreciate um, that Dr. Waters and Ms. Early have been working on this um, and um, am, am happy to see um, the beginning of, of some work that needs to be done. Because when we look at the novel list, not just in North Penn, but in, in many districts, um, they're not always reflective of all of your students and what you want every student to see, what the world looks like, right? Um, and so I'm appreciative. I know that you had to like, really get in there and do research. It was not just about calling up a bookstore and say, give me one. You really needed to do some research and see how it was going to align with Dr. Waters and Ms. Early for all of your hard work on this. It, it really is appreciated and very much aligned with our um, comprehensive goals for the district. So appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to just real briefly just echo the same sentiments. You know, it's um, Students um, at these formative years really you know, identify, figure out in a lot of ways who they are through the educational process. Obviously, a lot of that is socialization. A lot of that is exploring activities and extracurriculars. But a big piece of that is also through curriculum. And I think that this um, specific focus on um, finding texts with characters that um, students of color can identify with, can see themselves through those eyes, um, is at least the beginning, a start to really uh, make this district, again, more equitable and responsive to all of our students. Uh, again, it, it, having been in public schools for 20 years um, and uh, with the role that I play been through many, many districts with many, many novels, um, this really is a deficiency in a lot of public schools. And I'm very proud of the work that you all are taking on um, to make sure that we are um, making these uh, these texts, uh, something that are, are a shared experience for everyone. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, we appreciate it. Would you like to add something? Um, I, I really like this because I think the conversations that occur like once you, you know, read a chapter and then come back to school the next day and then like discuss about it. Um, like those conversations, I think really, you know, change people's mentalities, change people's, you know, beliefs. And I think that really helps us create that culturally proficient environment we're looking forward to achieve. Um, so yeah, I think it's a great first step. It's better than playing a video um, because there's a lot more conversation that you can hear, especially in a classroom setting where you already have a 
you know, that relationship with your teacher and that sort of trust with your, with your peers and stuff. I think it's nice, really nice. Thank you. We appreciate it, especially coming from one of our students. Thank you. Mrs. G, if I may, uh, two things. One, I just wrote a college recommendation letter today for Aditya, and I'm going to need you to stop talking in this meeting because every time you open your mouth, I have more good things to say about you. Um, so <laughs> I just really appreciate the insights that you put out there, Aditya. Um, it, it's just awesome. So thank you for that. And I also wanted to put out there um, for Dr. Waters and Ms. Early, um, it, obviously the pandemic has been challenging for everyone and um, we're all working really, really hard and burning the candle at both ends and skipping vacations and things like that. But these two ladies, I have the privilege of working right next to them. Their offices are next to mine. And they're just really, really um, putting in the hours and the effort to make this work. So on a larger scale, at the middle school level in particular, we have these new novels, which means, of course, that they have to read them and uh, be informed and guide the curriculum writing on them. There is a collapsing of levels uh, for many reasons. One of the reasons being providing better equity and access to all of our students, and also uh, to help us streamline instruction in a virtual model as we move into the fall here. Um, and then uh, we have block scheduling, we have Canvas. Uh, so they're tackling a lot of things, in particular in the English department. I'm just very proud of both of them. Um, and we're very fortunate to have them. And the, the public, I'm sure they appreciate them as well, but they don't get to see them every day like I do. So I just appreciate both of you and thank you. Okay, so uh, we need to adopt the models that are the novels. So if I could have a motion to. Um, yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Motion passes, and we will move on to virtual learning. Dr. 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 are you going to take the lead for that? Yeah, I was going to say have a presentation. If you need me to present it, I have it right here. Uh, that would be great, Bob, just because we have several presenters this evening. So, um, Dr. Rufo, hopefully will join us at some point, but if she's unable, um, uh, you, you're stuck with me, and uh, I will be emceeing this, and I have a portion of the presentation to share with you as well. But I believe we will kick it off here uh, with Dr. Santoro and uh, begin a discussion about what virtual education and instruction could look like uh, for the opening of school. Mr. Gilmer, if you could go to the next slide, please. And uh, I'll introduce to you Dr. Santoro. Great. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Todd. So um, I'll start with the elementary model for online learning. So we have our objective posted here uh, and you know that we wanna provide an effective and rigorous online learning platform at the elementary level um, that will be a balance of both synchronous and asynchronous lessons, activities, and assignments uh, that will be aligned to the PA standards and the North Penn curriculum. So just a summary of some of the items that I just wanted to put out there. Um, it will be a daily schedule, which will occur five days a week of instruction. Students will be assigned to a homeroom teacher from their home school. Uh, and I wanted to make note of that because previously when we were uh, working up the virtual option, there was the possibility that kids may not have their a teacher from their home building. But I just want to clarify that every student will have a teacher from their home building. Uh, as we know, Canvas will be the learning management system for all of our children. Attendance will be taken daily, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Specials will occur daily and we will focus on social emotional learning um, every day. Mr. Gilmer. So uh, the attendance piece, right now we're in conversation with uh, technology and looking at Canvas, whether we ca Canvas has the capability to take attendance so that we can see as students are going in and out of their different lessons. If that's not available, uh, we will take attendance in, in the homeroom each morning and just by the teachers just simply posting a question of the day. Um, in our departmentalized grades, in grades five and six, attendance will have to be taken there into each of those uh, sessions when the kids go into them. So that'll also happen. Uh, we still are encouraging parents to use our system of sending an email to the teacher or the building secretary or using our safe arrival system um, if the student will be absent. So in this way, we know up front um, and we can you know, the plan for that that the student is going to be absent. We do encourage our students to attend daily, but we do know that we must remain flexible because we know family routines and works and uh, working conditions 
that we have to take all that under consideration. So we will have that flexibility. All lessons that uh, we will provide that are synchronous will be recorded so that students do have the availability to review them later if they cannot be on those live sessions. Um, and then, you know, lastly, that we encourage our parents to keep in contact with their teacher about any missed work or any other extended learning circumstances so that we can support our students. Next slide. So just to break down for K to four, uh, we're looking at approximately two hours of synchronous instruction and approximately two hours of asynchronous for the children in grades K to four. And I'll break that down a little bit more into daily schedules. Um, in grades five to six, we're looking at approximately two to three hours of synchronous instruction and approximately two hours of asynchronous. And as we know, the instruction will be broken down into manageable instructional blocks so that students are not continuously uh, on the screen, but that there are times when students will be doing work that will be working from, you know, a consumable book or working actually manipulating um, materials right at home. Next slide. So for elementary, I just, uh, for elementary for K to two, I just caution you that this is a sample. It may look different um, by each building. The minutes will remain the same, but where they actually fall may look a little different. So I think keeping up with our um, vision of responsive classroom and also second step, uh, students would start out from nine to 9.45, um, engaged in the classroom meeting, teacher setting the schedule for the day, doing the morning message, um, in kindergarten, we still want to continue exploration stations, which is a big part of kids working kids working on their um, various motor skills. So we do want to continue that. From 9.15 to 11.15 would be an ELA instructional block. So you can see there where I noted 3.20 to 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes of synchronous instruction. That would be the teacher providing 20 to 30 minutes. So for example, it could be the teacher in second grade is doing a mini lesson. Um, on you know similarities and differences and that could be a 20-minute lesson and then the teachers then going to break out and have small groups rotating through so then this way kids will have that experience to be with the teacher and have that live instruction but also that we're taking our students the whole group and actually managing students in smaller groups so that we are giving more individualized support to teachers and to the students a special will occur every day from 11 15 to 12 if if that fits into the school schedule. So I'm just noting here, it's a 45 minute special. Um, and we can see the times broken down for some synchronous learning and also for the application of the skill that the students are receiving. Lunch and movement, uh, we've allotted an hour in all of the grade levels. You know, taking that lunch break, taking that time where it's your, your free time, your movement time, doing a little bit of exercise, just so the kids are getting up and they're moving around. Then in the afternoon, uh, in this schedule, we're proposing a 90 minute with math instruction, very similar, breaking students down into groups so that they get, they get their lessons that way, uh, mini lesson, and then breaking down into groups. Then we would have a break uh, for the K to two students in the afternoon for 15 minutes. Then we would go into social studies and science, broken down with synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, and the teachers may decide at the, prior, at, the, at the lower grades that they're going to do social studies, you know, for two weeks, and then they're going to move into science for two weeks. They often rotate that. And then the last piece that's important to note, bringing the students back together again at the end of the day at 3.15 to once again come on into a classroom meeting and wrap up for the day uh, of the activities and the learning. Next slide. So in grades three to four, the sample um, here. I'm sorry, Dr. Sinder, can you go back to K to two just for a second? Sure. Um, just because for people who are tuning in who are not um, as familiar with the social emotional piece of responsive classroom and second step, can you talk about that? Because we know what I know what responsive classroom and second step is, and probably the other two on the board do or on the committee do as well, but just so that others know what those two pieces are in terms of um, social emotional. Right. So, so responsive classroom, we have all of our teachers that have been trained in kindergarten in the responsive classroom. And that is really purposely the way we are greeting students, the way we have our morning meetings, the way we are interacting with other students in the classroom. Um, and that's the design of how we greet students. Students greet each other by name. Um, there's a morning message that is very explicit and we pull out some instructional skills in that morning message that the teacher posts. 
So that really is our kindergarten teachers that are doing that. We do have some first grades that are going into the responsive classroom model. And we have Marisa Neeson working with those schools, our early learning coordinator, um, to work with some first grade teachers. Second step, I'm glad you, um, you know, stopped me to talk about that. This will be the third year that we're using that social emotional curriculum. Uh, and it's basically teaching kids, you know, the social skills, um, character education, you know, the lessons on empathy, lessons on how to get along with each other, lessons on how we interact when we're in, in a group. So it's all those skills, those soft skills, we want to call them, of how we um, teach children how to get along with each other, how to express their feelings. So this year will be our third year doing this. Uh, we have all of our teachers trained in second step. They will be delivering second step. So um, we'll be rolling that out. We have the materials ready. We'll be doing a refresher in the beginning of the year um, just to make sure that everybody's on board with that. And then would you just talk a little bit about, let's just use math instruction as an example of how that can be interact, because I, I see how you have it divided out in whole group, small group, independent workstations. And I'm sure, again, there might be people who are looking at like that, like what does that look like um, for a teacher to be able to do that and how can that be interactive? Can you describe what maybe that might look like? Right, so the math lesson would be, once again, a teacher would teach the whole group and it could be 20 to 30 minutes where she has the whole class on. It could be a mini lesson on a concept. Then the teacher can break out and then say, okay, I'm gonna see this half of the class and then we're gonna actually do some guided practice together and working together through that while the other half of the class may be doing an independent activity or working through some assignments on Canvas. So the teacher will have that schedule. The students will know where they have to be at what time. But I think um, it's important to know that we're teaching small groups of children as we move through that block. Um, also, it's an opportunity if students need intervention and we have to provide extra support, um, we can have that pushed into the classroom. So that's also within that time block that we can um, make sure that that happens. Dr. Santoro, um, in regard to that math instruction, I'm wondering a large piece of what students, especially in these elementary grade levels are doing is using manipulatives. Are we preparing to distribute manipulatives to students so that they can use those in conjunction with the curriculum materials? Yes, that's an excellent question. As a matter of fact, Dr. Arnie, our math supervisor made sure that he ordered all the math manipulatives so that we can make sure that when we do a pickup of um, student materials that they have them at home because we believe the students have to be using those manipulatives while they're working through hands-on um, with the math concept. So yes, students will have that. Could I ask what method are we gonna record the uh, teacher lessons with? Is it gonna be a Google, Google Meets recording or is it gonna be through Canvas? I'm actually gonna- uh, I was gonna take that, sorry, Dr. Santoro. Uh, Mr. McBain, we can actually record lessons through Canvas, um, so. Canvas will be our hub for uh, video conferencing or synchronous learning. Great. Those lessons will be able to re be recorded. I believe Dr. Landis is in here if she wants to add anything. But. Um, no, I was going to say the same thing. We do have the ability to integrate Google Meet inside of Canvas as well. So we could use either tool, but we are coaching our teachers on the integrated tools within Canvas because they're easier to use. Sure. So from a parent perspective, a parent can go to Canvas and see pretty much everything they need to see on that day. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, Dr. Landis, you won't be using like Teams, you, you will strictly be using Canvas to, for the teacher to do, uh, to do everything, to stream the lesson and everything. Is that what you're saying? You won't yes, be using correct. like Zoom or Teams, you will be using Canvas to do that. Right, yes, we purchased the video package that can, is built into Canvas. Um, we also have integrated the G Suite tools, so teachers who are familiar with using assignments in Google Classroom will be able to use assignments in, inside of Canvas as well. So I have another question then. Um, and this actually came from my daughter. Um, at Pendale, apparently in the classes that she was taking, the students were instructed to not have their cameras on at any time. Um, that was something that she didn't like, and I'm just speaking anecdotally, but I, I would imagine that other students felt, you know, that it would be more of a collaborative experience if they got to see each other. Is that something that we are 
communicating to students that must be the case or are they allowed to have their cameras on during synchronous instruction so that other students are able to, they're able to see each other? Yeah, so uh, in the springtime, there absolutely was a level of discomfort um, with videos being on in homes um, for students and, it, and for teachers. And I think it was just a lack of familiarity at the time. Okay. Uh, we, we are setting a, a synchronous learning expectation, as you've obviously seen from Dr. Santoro, and then soon for the secondary level. Um, but the cameras were s defaulted off uh, during the springtime. Um, it, they could be turned on, but they were defaulted off. Oh, okay. and, I, and I know that the experience kind of depended on uh, who the students had, whether okay. or not the teachers wanted to have student cameras on or off. Um, and some of the challenge there, I do believe, had to do with uh, the recording of the videos as well. Uh, just not being comfortable with recording students' video and their faces. Um, so I haven't, I started my Canvas training. Um, I have not gotten to the point where I'm starting to learn about video conferencing. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to have more face-to-face -face opportunities for students. And uh, actually, Ifrad and Aditya shared that with me as well, um, that they really want the face-to-face -face mm -hmm. to be able to engage with their classmates. Yeah, I feel like that's going to be extraordinarily important for students, given the fact that this is not ideal, given the fact that so much of this social piece is missing from a virtual environment, to be able to at least see familiar faces every day and get used to a routine, I think is really going to be important for our students. Yeah, and I'll have another question. So even, let's say, for a certain class for one day, if sharing a screen is not needed, would Canvas still be able to just have a conference with all the students without pushing out a screen, like how Google Meet can? Yes. Um, Dr. Landis or, or Dr. Bauer, are we creating some parent videos um, in terms of how to use Canvas? I mean, I, I think I've, I've shared this many times. I utilize Canvas and, um, you know, once you get it, it can be very, it, it can be very useful, but uh, as a new tool, it can also be overwhelming. Um, so I'm just wondering what we are doing. I know that we have a lot of professional development that we've been pushing out to teachers and that we are planning for additional days for teachers for professional development at the beginning of the year. Um, a time for them to, to work through um, building their courses. But I'm, I'm wondering for families um, what, what we are providing in terms of um, professional, or, you know, not professional development, but just, you know, them getting some, their familiarity with um, Canvas as a tool and the things they need to do to get ready for, for this. Yeah, I also had a question like that, like how would you accomplish a student teacher or like a family and teacher relationship before like school starts? Would there be like an orientation or like a virtual orientation or are we just like hitting the road from day one? No, we um, just hired our, our two additional Canvas coaches. So um, they'll be starting with us next week and that will be on the agenda to discuss um, creating the student and the teacher training materials. Um, we aren't going to be syncing uh, our live courses until mid-August, so we, have, we won't be able to do training until we actually turn on the portal for students and parents. So that will be coming probably the third, probably fourth, third to fourth week in August that, that material will come out. And we also discussed today, just in the meeting uh, this afternoon with administrators, Dr. Dietrich, that a, a probably close to an hour and a half conversation um, with the administrative team. And there were conversations about uh, trying to have live sessions with parents and providing coaching for them as well. So um, while we are, I'm very proud of our progress since Thursday evening's meeting, uh, we still have some, some boxes to check and some things to develop, but we will get there. And the intention is to have training for parents and for students um, and have some live opportunities and even some evening opportunities once the school year begins uh, to provide that support. So. I'm glad Dr. you mentioned Bauer. that. Wanted to add, that was actually something that I had wanted to ask. There had been some conversation I personally had with um, Dr. Dietrich about trying to find some flexibility in terms of even like staff hours, certain staff members who may be willing to work mm -hmm. in a less traditional time frame to give direct um, support to families or students who have constraints due to work 
but they're still going to need that extra support in order to help their students achieve? Is that something that is happening in conversation at this point? Absolutely. Uh, we actually, yeah, we had a robust conversation about that this afternoon, about ways in which we could bring that to our families and our students, in particular um, at the elementary level, I think, to provide that support mm -hmm. to families, um, because we certainly want to make sure that we level the playing field and make sure that everybody can utilize the tools um, effectively, and we don't want that to be a hindrance in having a successful program in the fall, so. Uh, yeah, we had some pretty innovative ideas this afternoon, and I'm excited to see where the, this goes. But I don't doubt it. Dr. Santoro, our student rep had actually, actually an excellent question about orientation that I think is relevant K-12, to because all of the students will be coming into classrooms where they, they may have seen their teacher in the hallway, but they, they might not know exactly who they are, and our kindergarten students will be new to um, the building and the and their teacher and so what are we talking about in terms of what orientation could look like I know you're still fleshing out a plan but um, to, to our student rep's point we we're just wondering you know are we just is it day one and class has started or is there any type of orientation um, that's going to be happening yeah so in particular for kindergarten actually what I'm going to do is on August 17th we are actually um, offering a virtual session for all of our incoming kindergarten parents, and it will be an overview session, and we have them broken out at three different times. Um, and then I have clusters of principals that will sit on those calls, so parents will sign up pertaining to their school, and we'll do the overview similar to like what we did last spring, not the spring, the spring before, um, when we went out and we did those sessions live, um, and we had a really good turnout. So I think, you know, for kindergarten, I have to start there and do that general overview of what kindergarten is going to look like and then especially the level of detail in this virtual environment. Uh, we are thinking for kindergarten on August 26th because we do have that slated as orientation for kindergarten that we will do something virtual, but it'll be at the building and it'll be the classroom teacher leading it and actually meeting the students um, and then just becoming familiar with the students. And then the other grades, we are also um, looking at the possibility of working with teachers to do the same things for all the grade levels. Like we don't, really don't want the first day of school for that to be when the teacher's going to actually reach out and, and you know be in contact with their student there has to be some pre-work so all that is under conversation right now but um you know the big lift was actually you know looking at our incoming k parents you have a lot of new parents who've never had their kids in school so we wanted to make sure that we did uh get that out enough you know august 17th a quick question is there be a traditional back to school night uh, not traditional, obviously, in person, but I mean, like, is there going to be opportunity for a back-to-school night as well where parents are interfacing in a specific meeting for teachers? Yes, and we're looking at that virtually as well yeah. uh, to do those okay. meetings. Okay, cool. A quick question. Uh, under the presentation here, it illustrates that the secondary education choices include North Penn Virtual Academy for fully asynchronous learning. What is our answer to the parent who has to come home after work and then finds themselves going through a lot of recorded lessons with their child starting at 5 or 6 p.m. I'm sorry, was that, did you say secondary? I thought that was a secondary question. So, Dr. Santoro, Mr. McBain's question was um, the North Penn Virtual Academy with the asynchronous option uh, for secondary, and then what are we going to be able to do, Mr. McBain, I think, and if I misheard you, please correct me, um, about elementary students who can't necessarily log in at a given time to see lessons uh, that have been pre-recorded. How can we provide support to those? And students? I ask this with full understanding that you've had a very short amount of time to answer these very questions. <laughs> so yeah, but we, we discussed it today, so we're, we're prepared. <laughs> yeah, so I think one of the things that we're looking at in some of the brainstormed ideas is actually having like, um, like a hotline, like where we have a bank of uh, educators that where parents can call in and ask their questions and have that staff member navigate through whatever their questions are or to review things with them. So we just started to talk about that today and I do have a team of principals that are gonna work along with me to see how that'll pan out. So I'm actually thinking of, you know, let's look at the resources we have. Can we have perhaps maybe reading teachers that are gonna say, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night, I'm gonna be available these hours. It's an ELA question, it's a reading question or I'm gonna have math assistants um, that are you know, well-versed in math, I'm gonna have them as part of that team. So we just have to look at all of our resources. I'm also you know, looking at our ESL learners too. 
um, making sure the parents have those avail that availability in the evening as well if they have some questions about you know the learning that occurred during the day and then I just need this time where I can then just check in and get my questions answered and clarified. So we actually just brainstorm that today because we know we're going to have to be flexible and we want to be able to support our parents. So we'll be working up a plan this week. Yeah, thank you for that. It's, it's a very difficult job that you've been given to create a robust program and then have it be also a program that can be done quickly, efficiently in the evening, but still be meaningful because of all the different family situations that we're dealing with. So thank you for that. Right. You're welcome. Dr. Landis, you mentioned that there were two coaches that were hired. So how many can how many coaches do we have that are completely familiar with Canvas that can be very accessible to teachers to make sure that if if uh, the video conferencing is getting clunky and they're in trying to start their math lesson that they don't have 25 kids at home that are you know I'm just thinking of the things that can go wrong. How many coaches do we have? So you want me to? Oh, go, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Lynn. Sorry. Um, so we have four coaches um, that were hired learning coaches, um, and then we have a, a tech support specialist team of seven people as well who are who work under the learning coaches, and they are actually doing the Canvas training virtual synchronous for teachers right now. So. Um, they actually have buildings assigned to them. So four across the district, two identified as elementary, two as secondary, and then the seven TSSs each have a building. So teachers know, for example, if I'm at Gwinnett Square, I contact Karen McDermott as my first line of contact to get me help. Um, and we'll also be training our, our, our tech assistants as well to provide that support uh, in the event that it's needed. And is there literally like some type of help desk that they can call, that they can get someone pretty immediately, um, other than you know shooting an email to someone and needing to wait some time. I mean, is it pretty? I'm just wondering how the kind of the structure. Are you still figuring that out? Sure. No, absolutely. We have um, a specific email address that we're man the TSS team is manning every day um, for North Penn, and then we also contracted with Canvas for immediate chat support. So if teachers can't get one of our staff and they have a question that they need answered right away, they can also write within Canvas, click on chat with a, a Canvas representative and um, they can get a representative as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if we go to the next schedule, um, that's grades three and four, following the format now where we see from nine to 9.30 will be that classroom meeting, second step, morning message. Um, teacher setting the day, setting, you know, what the schedule will look like. Again, we have a 90-minute block of ELA instruction with the asynchronous uh, and synchronous, with the synchronous lessons throughout and the teacher giving the direct instruction then breaking down into groups. Once again, we have 45 minutes for specials, that hour for a block for lunch and movement time, go into our math instruction. Social studies uh, in the afternoon now picks up because getting into the, um, as we progress through the grades, we know the content becomes a little bit more, you know, complex. So we need to spend a little bit more time um, in social studies and in science. Uh, so that's why we increase that to an hour, but the balance of the synchronous and asynchronous. And then once again, wrapping up the day with coming back together as a class and doing that wrap up. We go to the next slide. Same thing in grades five and six. Grades five and six, uh, we have a classroom meeting that will start in the beginning of the day uh, with the second step lesson. So on the first day on Mondays, that lesson, that time will go into about a half hour because the initial lesson, the kickoff lesson in the beginning of the week is a half hour, and then throughout the rest of the week we can do some follow-ups on the topic. Um, ELA instruction, 90 minutes. Specials, the 45 minutes. That hour break in the middle of the day the math instruction. And then here in, the, uh, in, in social studies and science, we pick up to a full 90 minutes because we know that there's a lot of um, work that the kids need to do in science and in social studies. So we wanna make sure that we're allotting that 90 minute block. And in our departmentalized grades, because it's five and six are departmentalized, the teachers will have their, um, they've always had 90 minute blocks for those subject areas. So they can then navigate as they through, go through and schedule the kids um, for each of those sections. Next slide. So this is just a wrap up of the specials. 
Um, I just did want to note that we will, students will have the same special for 45 days and then they'll switch to the next special. And the reason for doing that is that it gets to be a little confusing on a four day cycle. So we didn't want to keep rotating specials um, because it just becomes confusing. So we just, we wanted to start off with having in this virtual environment, the same special for 45 days and then rotate through the next. Next slide. Um, Dr. Santor, can we go back for a second to, to specials? I'm just wondering what will, and you can say I'm not sure because <laughs> you may not be sure, what, what would then happen when kids go back? Are we, are we saying that we would just follow this 45 day concept for the rest of the year? Or what would happen, like the kids go back to school, Let, let's just say the kids go back, we, we can get the kids back to school after November 6th, what would then happen? Would they keep going through the 45 days or would we still need to work out the logistics of what might happen? I mean, it's under discussion. I've had pros and cons both ways. Like a lot of the principals say, let's just keep it throughout the rest of the year um, because we already started it that way. Um, and then some say, if we can get back into where it's, you know, at, at that exact time of that 45 day, can't we then just go back into rotation? So I really don't want to give an answer. I really would want more conversation, especially getting input from the special area teachers and the special ed and the special area department chairs as well. So I think we can plan that out when once we know that we'll be phasing back in and what that'll look like. But kids can expect to see their art teacher or their phys ed teacher yes. doing a live lesson with them, showing them, demonstrating, modeling, and then providing them an opportunity to apply the, the skill. Exactly. Yes. Yes. All right, if we go to the next slide, I'm going to now turn it over to Dr. Arnie, and he's going to talk about our assessments and grading. Okay, thank you, Dr. Santoro. Um, I uh, helped facilitate um, a group um, during our um, reopening committee that focused on elementary assessments and grading. Um, so for uh, the fall, moving forward, uh, the standards-based grading system will resume as it had in um, previous years where the students will be graded uh, based on the standards three times a year um, because our elementary students are in trimesters. So they'll receive grades in uh, December, March, and June um, based on the standards. Um, teachers will have the opportunity to meet with parents um, both in November and March for our virtual uh, conferences. But uh, be mindful that you know, if a parent emails a teacher at any time, a conference can be organized and arranged. Um, for the assessments, looking at specifically for our content in um, ELA, um, the district um, is embarking on a new journey with a, a company uh, called Renaissance Learning, and we're using their tool called Star 360. Um, actually, we're using this tool for ELA and math, but what this tool does, it's a universal screening tool. It's administered to all kids in grades K to six. Um, it's, uh, it's about a 20 minute screening uh, tool that assesses students on grade level content uh, and the standards. And at the end of the, um, the assessment, it gives uh, the teachers uh, immediate feedback on where a student falls in grade level uh, standards. Um, and the, te the teachers can use this to set goals and progress uh, monitor their students um, based on um, you know, remediation or uh, enrichment. Uh, on, and the uh, STAR 360 is aligned to Pennsylvania standards as well. Uh, similar to math, it's the same concept. Um, the, te the teachers will administer this three times per year. Um, uh, following the assessment calendar, typically looking at a September, to January, and uh, May administration. Um, see the CDTs, um, which was a, a state assessment uh, that kind of followed the path of the PSSAs, is going to um, be removed for for the time being because we felt that the amount of time that the CDTs took to administer uh, didn't give us the same amount of information that we can get immediately from the STAR assessment. Um, one thing that I will mention um, that the STAR 
that's the star assessment can be administered in the virtual setting. And we are working uh, with Renaissance Learning to come up with protocol to provide uh, the teaching to our teachers to administer it in the virtual setting. Um, and that's pretty much it. The teachers will use curriculum-based assessments across all content areas that are all uh, already uh, designed um, and are aligned to the different content standards. When students are um, used, when screening tools are used to assess student reading levels, especially in elementary grades, and then they're grouped accordingly based on those needs, are we presuming to do that by grade level or are we going to do that by class? So when we're breaking into the smaller groups based on student um, results on screening tools, you know, these students are high needs versus students that are accelerated, right? Are we going to be looking at that from a teacher's role or from the whole grade level? Because in the, many of the buildings I've worked in traditionally, it's more of like a grade level sort of, but is that something we're able to do in a virtual environment? So let me just caution uh, or clarify, actually, the STAR 360 is just one tool sure. that the teachers are going to use to make the decision um, based on how to group a student uh, for ELA. Um, yeah, so, the, so a teacher in a classroom will, will be able to group their students uh, across similar uh, levels. So you may have a group of a second grade classroom may have a high group that it, of kids that are being remedi um, you know, on the third or fourth grade level, and then they may have kids on level, and then they may have a group of kids that are below level. Um, keeping in mind that during the ELA block, there's also time for intervention and remediation where the kids are maybe pulled out for additional support for Wilson instruction or uh, additional, um, uh, you know, um, fluency instruction. So in the core reading group, um, during your guided reading time, a teacher is pr being provided uh, lessons based on the kids in their classroom. So the Wilson groups would be um, pulled during that same reading block? So for, for example, if a reading block is, if you, if you looked at the model that Dr. Santoro provided, uh, where it's 30, 30, 30, or something like that. So 30 minutes would be a uh, small group guided reading, 30 minutes would be um, a shared reading, and then 30 minutes would be uh, pulled out, targeted, you know, for Wilson or, or for LLI or for whatever uh, the targeted um, reading skill is for that student. Okay, good. Yes, um, really no different than... It's really no different than the way it is uh, now. Um, you know, it's just uh, we're, we're transitioning from not having the kids, you know, walk down to the reading support teacher's classroom. Now we're doing it virtually within, you know, um, and, in and, virtual. And Dr. Arnie, that actually very much gets to the heart of the question is how much different in terms of the functional piece of it would look the same as what they've been used to. Even of course, it being in a virtual environment, but it does sound like we're being consistent in terms of the approach. So thank you for that. I think it's just going to be a matter of going to a different screen to meet with a different teacher for whatever the targeted skill is that you need um, mm -hmm. based on how you're performing in the screening tools that, you're, that are being administered to you. So that, I think that's all. Assessments. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I jump on Mr. McDean? Mr. McGing, were you going, you can go ahead. No, that wasn't me. You're free to go, I think. I was, I was wondering, are all of these assessments, so they are already available for online use? This is, if they're going to be ready to go. And then if I'm a parent, I'm looking at this thinking, wait, are you saying that my child is going to be spending a lot of instructional time sitting in front of a computer taking assessments? And so to how much time are we talking about would a STAR assessment take and how often, I'm thinking if I'm a parent, I would wanna know that, um, how often and how much time and are they available? This isn't something that teachers need to, to fumble with at the beginning of the year and figure out like another, because they're gonna be very busy with Canvas. So that's a, so that's a great question. So let me give you a, a, a for example, 
the, one of the reasons I heard of, overwhelmingly from teachers um, to consider removing the CDTs is that CDTs in person could take uh, up to an hour to two to three hours per grade, per grade level, depending on the, the pacing of the student. And you multiply that three times per year. So you're talking six to nine hours of an assessment uh, for math. So for the STAR assessment, it's a, th it's a three time per year uh, screening tool that takes 20 minutes per administration, 22 minutes, 20 to 22 minutes. So you're capitalizing on the gain of instructional time um, by still getting the same amount of information um, about a student's progress. What's nice is that um, I didn't talk about this specific, specifically, but we also um, purchased a, a learning uh, platform called Freckle. So the information that we gather from STAR 360 for ELA math and ELA directly links it uh, to Freckle, which is a platform that students could go on independently and matriculate based on how they perform on their assessment. So it's an online learning management like a book platform that when you look at their independent time in ELA and math, the teacher can assign them to work independently and they could progress based on how they perform on the STAR assessment. Thank you. Hopefully I didn't give you too much information there. <laughs> no, no, thank you. All right, so then just wrapping this up uh, for the elementary side, you know, t t the teachers will offer office hours uh, daily and they'll have, she, he or she will have them posted um, for the week. So we know we still want to continue that. Um, and if, you know, at all times, if um, parents and teachers need to connect, they can always come up with a mutual time that works within their schedules to meet. Um, our teachers are always responsive to parents and they get back to parents in a timely manner. So I think all these things will be, you know, um, once we start to set the schedules per building, uh, I think then teachers would then ha have an opportunity then to kind of, you know, navigate when they will be doing their office hours. And then the last thing I just wanted to note that you guys already talked a little bit about, um, you know, we will be sending home materials. We want to make sure that students have their consumable books, that they have their manipulatives. Um, students in the younger grades in K and 1, they do foundations and Hegarty and they have, you know, letter tiles that they manipulate and they put on their boards when they're making their words, you know, for phonemic awareness. So, all of these things um, we're planning out. We're working with our curriculum department to come up with a list of the materials to make sure that we it's equitable in all of our schools, that everybody is getting all the materials they need. Um, so that's something that we are working on right now. So I just wanted to mention that. And then we have to figure out how we're going to distribute that, which will then be another um, you know, arrangement that the principals will make per building and how we can get the materials at home to the families. Dr. Santoro, does any of what you just discussed in terms of materials change anything for families in terms of school supply lists? Are our school supply lists changing? Um, because, and I say that because, you know, oftentimes you see them at like Staples or, you know, they're on the, they're on like the side where you can grab them. And I just, I'm thinking that this may change things in terms of what maybe a teacher might like need or want to ask for and also being conscious across the district to have some consistency among the grade levels or elementary schools um, so that we are conscious of how much we would be asking a family to purchase, especially during this time. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm wondering about kind of the consistency and the cost and um, if there's a change and when and where those would be posted. Right, so most of the school sent their supply list out in June. Um, because they typically do that at the end of the school year for the next year so the parents have an idea. Um, and we knew that we wanted to, to have materials ha separated. The kids have their own belongings that we were no longer putting all the crayons in a crayon bin. So some lists have already gone out and some have not. So right now we're working with our one subcommittee on a recommended list. We don't want to add any other cost to parents. Um, but, you know, a supply list will go out from the schools that didn't send one. We do want to have that consistency. We also want to look at families if they need some support with supplies, that we will be able to provide that. And we're also talking through, you know, looking at the Ed, Ed Foundation where they get the donations of supplies and also what we have within our buildings that principals have already purchased. So right now we're working through one of the subcommittees that made a recommended, recommended list. 
but just to say that some of the lists did go out. We want to communicate to the parents to make sure that we are consistent. Um, we don't want to add any more to them if they've already spent money on getting supplies. But for the families that haven't, we will come up with that recommended list that we can share with them. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Santoro. And now we will transition to secondary. Um, so unless otherwise delineated, I just wanna make the point here that when I talk about secondary, I'm talking about middle and high school. Um, so there have been some questions where I did not make that clear. So I just wanna be uh, clear up front. This is for middle and high school. Um, so our objective here was is to provide a robust and engaging online learning experience for all secondary students that meets our high expectations within this North Penn learning community. Um, and we are prepared to present two options to our families. Um, one already existed, which is the 100% asynchronous learning through North Penn Virtual Academy. Uh, we call that MPVA. And um, we also now are going to implement a, a normal schedule, and I will share the bell schedule, so it's not the traditional schedule, but a normalized schedule that we'll be utilizing at the secondary level uh, for, and having expectations for live synchronous instruction. Um, and then lessons will be recorded similar to elementary within Canvas. Um, and as Dr. Landis pointed out, we could utilize uh, Google Meets within Canvas and Canvas has their own tool. Next slide, please, Mr. Gilmer. So our goals here, uh, providing students with access to all the courses and curricula that they would see in the traditional setting, um, have synchronous learning in each class on each day, and lastly, we want to be creative and innovative in our thinking to develop opportunities for students to engage in school beyond academics. Here we're talking about clubs and activities that can still exist safely uh, in, when we begin school. So I'm um, going to begin with synchronous learning. And uh, I hit on this as, you know, on several slides, so I just want to be abundantly clear that all students will be scheduled into the synchronous model unless they were already in the North Penn Virtual Academy last year. Uh, so regardless of what they chose in the surveys a few weeks ago, all students will be scheduled as if um, it was a normal start to the school year and they will be scheduled with their teachers and we will follow their course requests. So our hope here is to have all course offerings and provide access to all the courses that students requested in the spring. Um, so synchronous online learning unlike the structure in March, it's presented in live sessions with teachers and students participating virtually. And some important notes here, um, we are assuming that they will be synchronous unless we hear otherwise, and I will provide some instruction on how to tell us otherwise uh, on future slides, and there will be communications coming out soon um, before the end of the week about how to notify us if you want asynchronous. Um, there will be a bell schedule for those synchronous components, uh, students will be expected to sign in at specific times, and we will take attendance, as Dr. Santoro mentioned. And a genuine assessment of content mastery will take place. Beginning in March, we did have a, uh, a special grading structure to uh, recognize student engagement online and um, their effort, but we will now revert to a more traditional grading structure and offer the autonomy to our teachers uh, to grade within uh, the confines of an online learning environment. Dr. Bauer, in terms of a genuine assessment, can you describe what some of those things might be beyond a quiz or a test? Because again, if I'm thinking about a parent at home, I also want to know that my child's still going to have an opportunity to, if they're not a good test taker, that they won't, all of their grades won't be based on online, multiple choice quizzes and tests, but that there will be opportunities for project-based learning and, and that kind of thing. Yes. Lab, so Right, so similar to what you heard from Dr. Santoro, we are going to um, clearly outline a hope and a desire to provide group, excuse me, group work, uh, projects, individual small breakout groups where teachers can uh, float into those meetings and support students. I would expect more interviews and uh, conversational assessment in this environment, talking to students more in smaller groups to best gauge their understanding. Um, certainly taking tests online is not the always the best option. There will be times where our students will leverage tools within Canvas or in Link It like they have in the past um, and take some assessments online, certainly. And there will certainly be essays and presentations put together, uh, but there will also be many more uh, less conventional 
uh, assessment opportunities for our students because quite frankly, it's, um, I was a math teacher, I was a high school math teacher, and uh, sometimes that's, uh, it's difficult in a virtual environment to take a math test. Um, so we will have, I'm sure, traditional tests and quizzes take place, but also we are going to be um, striving to equip our teachers with the tools to make sure that we can assess in other ways virtually. Similar to what Dr. Santoro was talking about um, in terms of looking at resources and how we can use them at other times, I'm just wondering, are you looking at that at the secondary level in terms of, and I'll just give an example, I had a high school student and if she wanted help in math, she would be able to go during um, that time period that was like before or after lunch, I forgot what it was called. <laughs> it was like an extended lunch period, um, or she could go during a pen time. And so how how now will that look so that for those people who want to connect with their teacher or, or with someone else, or are there other resources even outside of the teacher where you can get extra help in math or especially with us collapsing some levels and some other subjects, I'd just like to hear about how we're going to support students there as well. Right, so uh, I appreciate you leading the witness here because uh, that's coming up on a future slide. So we have it embedded in our bell schedule um, and I, I will hit on that I think in two slides. So uh, Mr. Gilmer, if you can give me option two here. Option two is uh, North Penn Virtual Academy. This is led by Mr. Galante and um, he will be the point of contact. He's on the meeting this evening so he can field questions about North Penn Virtual Academy. But this uh, is not a COVID thing. North Penn Virtual Academy existed. And we have North Penn teachers leading instruction. Uh, we do utilize the Edgenuity platform um, and their curricula is aligned to our curricula. So we actually take lessons and modules and assignments out of their platform and push them to our students based upon their needs. Um, and we will provide office hours and opportunities for students actually to even um, reach out to those teachers individually at Northbridge. Um, so they, they, some days during the week, they are with students in Northbridge and some of their days are designated for virtual instruction. Um, so there's, a, there are hybrid options within Northbridge and uh, the portion that is North Penn Virtual Academy is an asynchronous model uh, utilizing ingenuity with our teachers teaching to students who are virtual. Um, so I think it's important to share that this is, this is something that always existed. We have great success with this. Um, and Mr. Galante will be your point of contact. But we did hear from some families that the asynchronous model did work well for me. Um, I appreciated the flexibility to log in when I wanted to, to do my work when I wanted to on my time. Whether it's a high school student that needed to go to work or care for a younger sibling, uh, there is still a need. I heard from many parents that still want the option for asynchronous instruction. Um, so this is the, the established method that we have for asynchronous. So let me answer Mrs. G's question. If you would, Mr. Gilmer, next slide. Uh, real quick, important note, uh, notice the red there to try to grab everyone's attention that we will default to the synchronous option uh, for our families unless uh, you reach out to Mr. Galante and the schedules that are about to follow are samples or concepts as Dr. Santoro outlined as well. This does not mean I have a seventh grade schedule in the next slide where I'll be able to address Mrs. G's question. And it doesn't mean every seventh grader will have this schedule. It's just a sample schedule for a seventh grader. Okay, Mr. Gilmer, I think we're ready. Okay, so if you recall, our seventh grade or our middle schoolers are utilizing a block schedule. Some of the motivation uh, behind that was to build stronger relationships with their teachers, um, have fewer major courses for our middle school students at one time so that they can focus on um, just two or three major courses instead of four or five at one time. Um, and it will just allow us to, um, in a real world environment, when we transition back, we will have fewer transitions from class to class and fewer points of contact with other students and with teachers. Um, but here is a sample of what a seventh grade schedule could look like. And notice this is, this is not a bell schedule in the live environment. This is a schedule for a virtual environment. So you're seeing here, um, I don't have control of the mouse. So Bob, I'm gonna try my best to kind of guide if you could point to, yeah. So marking period one and two, that's semester one. 
Um, so uh, the student would begin in September in these two columns here, in marking periods one and two. So for seventh graders, they may start their day with, say, their, their quarterly minors. So they might have, uh, in the first marking period, art from 8.30 to 9.10, followed by health. And then the second marking period, which is scheduled to begin on November 7th, um, they would have FCS and then their Tech 7 course, which is business and uh, technology education. So their first block in seventh grade would be a minor here. Then as they transition to block two, these are their twice per cycle minors. So the way that they worked in the previous schedule prior to the block schedule was that you would have uh, PE on A and D day, uh, music on B and E, and exploratory language, which is Spanish, French, and German on C and F day. So those are unchanged with the block schedule, that they will still have those, those minor courses that happen twice a cycle. The, the dramatic change here is when we get down to block three. But prior to that, you'll see there, Mrs. G, there's a, a full hour uh, where we thought it was important to have the entire grade, all teachers, all students, to have off at the exact same time um, so that there's an ability to get support, ability to make up assignments, to do group work. Um, Dr. Santoro mentioned a, a movement break. Um, so students, if that's what works for them, but everyone will be scheduled instead of having that lunch rotate through their schedules and which lunch do you have? Do you have the first lunch, the second lunch? Everybody has a break at the same time to provide accessibility. Um, that's where you would actually see some pen time as you reference Mrs. G or lunch study at the high school. Um, but everybody's gonna have this break at the same time. And then they will move to block three for a, in this semester, the student has reading and then they have science. So they have their minors in block one and two, and then they have reading and science in blocks three and four. You'll notice that the actual schedule itself has uh, roughly an hour of instruction. Um, so the blocks, if we were in person in brick and mortar buildings would be roughly 80, I believe it's 84 minutes. Um, we're not saying 84 minutes of live synchronous instruction. We're saying uh, 60 minutes of instruction, whether that be 20 minutes of class meetings, setting expectations, going over last night's assignments, and then providing a guide for students to break into groups. And then the teacher kind of touch, uh, touching base with those groups. Or perhaps it's just one of those lessons that there's time where there's just engaging discussion with the full class. Um, but we are blocking off a time of an hour there, and then there's a 20 minute kind of buffer in the middle uh, that provides opportunities for students to get support from their teachers, begin their homework, um, ask questions of their teacher, but there's 20 minutes in between periods there for their majors where they have the opportunity to get support. Bob, you are doing a great job. It's as if I am controlling that mouse. Good job. Dr. Bauer, I have a quick question. Yes. Yes, for the for the intervention, will that be strictly a break or will that time also be used to hold like school wide assemblies or virtual assemblies or will that just yeah. be a break? Great question. So in the brick and mortar environment, it would be lunch and pen time. Um, but in speaking to the middle school principals today, I do think that that will be a great time for them to if they do provide programming to students like a virtual assembly, as you're um, hinting at, that's when they would do it. But keep in mind in the morning, there is a morning announcements and that's going to be pretty flexible, whether it's um, they're utilizing some restorative justice or restorative practices lessons, uh, whether they're highlighting some student accomplishments or touching base with their principal, like a morning message. But there's a, there's a time in the beginning of the day that they could do some of that. Um, but I do believe that they would utilize the time in between block two and block three in seventh grade uh, to do something if it was full grade assembly. Dr. Bauer, can you clarify Bauer, something? If, I'm, looking, if I'm a seventh grader. Seeing oh. marking period, as I'm seeing block one and A and one B combined, they're like 8.30 to 9.50. Block two says 9.50 to 10.30 and lunch is 11.10. So am I missing something? What happens between 10.30 and 11.10? Um, I am going to guess that that is a typo. Okay. I was wondering. Yeah. That's a long, uh, there, yeah, a, you know what? No, I, I think I do know what that is. I think that is the same buffer that we're talking about and getting support in between the periods. See okay. the gray there? Um, 
yeah, so it's kind of hard to transition this to the actual bell schedule, but that's what it is. So between block one and block, or block two and block three, I'm sorry, there's some time in there to, for them to get some support. from. Okay, the, good, okay. And yeah. so teachers are available during that time for students who have individual issues or questions and, okay. Correct, yes. Mrs. G, did I get that um, question? I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's. I'll, I'll, I can, remember, can I, I'll remember shortly. Can I chime in real quick? Uh, Dr. Bauer, thank you. This is uh, extraordinarily detailed. I wonder because I'm an optimist and I'm hoping that everyone is uh, able to safely, come, to safely come back to schools as soon as possible. Yes. I wonder if there will be a massive difference between the experience of a student who has reading or science in your example in the first semester versus the second semester. And I know that when other schools have made transitions to the block schedule, some courses uh, have been an every other day schedule. So for example, block three, one day they have reading, the next day they have English. Block four, one day they have science, the next they have world cultures and geography. Is there a reason why that doesn't fit for us particularly and I worry only because especially in the area of math for example a student who has math in the fall and then not in the spring may not see that math uh, that next math course for quite an amount of time on the block schedule here. Great points Mr. McBain and I don't have the perfect answer. Um, that is a drawback to block scheduling but something we did try to consider when we developed this and I think you would better see it if we were actually looking at um, the true bell schedule for when students are in the building, because there is intervention time built into every day, whether it's pen time or intervention. And that's the time that we're hoping to utilize to continue that education uh, for some of the courses that maybe they're not having from January, end of January through May. Now, um, I have to be totally transparent and honest that one of the motivations here in not doing the AB was uh, to, to plan and be in our health and safety plan, um, to not have students mixing with just as many students as they would in a traditional setting. And same with our teachers. Rather than our teachers seeing six groups of students, they're seeing three. Um, so contact tracing, trying to keep kids safe, it really does simplify it. And this also gives our teachers, I think, more uh, prep time. Uh, to prepare with the challenges of the virtual learning. So uh, those were the motivations. It is not perfect. Um, it is similar to like a college schedule. You could have math first semester freshman year and not have math again until your sophomore year. Um, one question I have been asked is about um, the Keystone exams and the Keystone exams are offered in January. So if our students are taking algebra in the first semester they, and they choose to take the Keystone exams, they could take it as soon as they complete math. Um, but great questions. Mr. Gilmer, can we transition to the proposed? Question. Yes. Uh, would there still be final exams at the end of the year for these classes or would it be right after you guys finished? Uh, the course? Yeah, Ifrad, great question. Uh, I can tell you that as of three or four weeks ago, that was the thought, mm -hmm. that we would still have final exams, maybe not midterm exams. Um, I mm -hmm. do think having a, a summative cumulative exam is important to help prepare our students uh, for life beyond North Penn. Uh, no matter what your profession or trade, there are cumulative exams at some point, uh, but we're discussing what the right way to implement final exams is going to be. So could there be a change in how much it's worth, what it looks like? Absolutely. Um, but right now the thinking, we're not there yet. Uh, we're not ready to prepare for the end of the year. Um, but I do think there will be summative assessments to some degree. Yes. Good so, question. Dr. Bauer, um, yes, one of the one of my questions in terms of um, one of I think the issues with, when we transferred to Infinite Campus, at least that I experienced, and I think others may experience, were not always knowing what was going to be graded, does that make sense? So if you're a student who was looking at it, you you know, you would check your grades every day and you were kind of hearing, but remember they were in a virtual environment, right? So, but they didn't know that like this marking period is going to have 10 items that are going to be part of my grade or three items that are part of my grade because, so I'm just wondering, 
how will parents know what the grade is going to be based on if you have a middle school or a high school student? Is there going to be some type of syllabus? Is there going to be, you know, how will they know other than, because, you know, teachers are going to be busy teaching and I know that they're going to be inputting their grades and everything, but, some, but we, what we don't want is for, for, you know, kids who need to do well in the first marking period because of college, applying to colleges and that kind of thing. Like, we want to be very clear about what our expectations are. So I'm just wondering, like, are we going to have a syllabus so that people know exactly what their grade is going to be based on or, or what, how will they know? Yes. So Dr. Waters and I had uh, the, the chance to meet with some folks in technology and our curriculum department last week uh, to talk about the template in Canvas. And one of the things that we are having uh, clearly visible in every course on Canvas is that uh, course expectations or syllabus. Um, so that will be in every course in Canvas. Um, we are actually building that into our template. Um, so that's, that's a great question. You, I feel like you are reading my mind. So. And the syllabus, because you know a syllabus could just have a course description. So the yes. syllabus will have a course description as well as these are the items that are going to be this is what the grade is going to be based on in this in this course. I feel like I just feel really strongly that is so important for families. Um, Infinite Campus to me is a little clunky, <laughs> and uh, I mean, you know, it's just it did not um, it, it did not completely meet my expectations. And I'm also wondering about progress reports. Last year, um, Infinite Campus didn't have the ability to. I can't remember exactly what the answer was of why we weren't pushing out progress report reports. You may remember that, but again, more than ever before, I think that parents do need that red flag of like, you know, it, it is like kind of an alert system of like, uh-oh, something, you know, something's not right here. I need to check in with the teacher at the middle school or high school level. So what's the reason that why we can't have some type of um, progress report or like what, what was the reason behind that? So initially, and Dr. Landis, if you're still with us, I don't have everybody's face up on the screen right now, but um, initially it was that it's actually live, a live grade book. Mm -hmm. And in comparison to eSchool um, and our parent portal there, it was not always live. Um, so what we did instead was just alert parents that it was mid marking period and please check your students' grades. Um, that's, I believe that's a structure and it actually does a grade pull every week for eligibility. And we just, um, it wasn't a separate entity within Infinite Campus. It was live all the time as opposed to some of the time. And then eSchool, we would have update halfway through the marking period so that it was live. Is that correct, Dr. Landis? You have yes, that's correct. Yep. Now that you're correct. I don't ever recall alert. I, I don't ever recall an alert. And I have the app on my phone and everything. I mean, Mr. Pusco, do you recall an alert? Uh, no, and I do um, share the concern specifically when it comes to, the thing about the red flags, as you put it, is that the students oftentimes in my experience who are the ones who um, need those progress reports sent home are often the ones whose parents are not always so tuned into what's going on. Um, so, you know, by specifically highlighting who those kids are, I think it sent that extra message to families to say, hey, you know, we really need you to um, get in touch with us and we need to come up with some planning on what to do about your students' progress. Um, it is a model that I would prefer as opposed to just alerting people to, hey, you should check your kids' grades now. Mass sent out to everyone. So the, let me be clear, Mrs. G, the, when I say alert, it was not an infinite campus alert. Um, I believe it was posted in parent portal and then the principals included it in like their weekly communication. Uh, so let me explore some better ways to make sure that we get that out, even if it could be um, put in the backpack. Dr. Landis, I know that like, that's a new tool that we're utilizing. That yes. if, if we can place a PDF in a student's yeah. backpack, then the parents can see that. I disagree with Mr. Fosco. Just a mass email that says, hey, check your kids' grades is not the same as a progress report. And parents know, hey, I'm, you know, I, it's a progress report. So it's, in parents' minds, a progress report is like a mid-report card. And it gives kids a chance to catch up, right? 
And I think in this environment more than ever, when typically a teacher might see a kid in their class, sorry about the boss barking dogs, people, <laughs> see a kid and say, hey, buddy, come on over. We need to check in because I'm a little worried and you need to catch in on catch up on these assignments. I know teachers are going to still be trying to do that, but in this environment, we really need to make sure that parents are able to be in touch with their um, with what's going on. And we can't assume that they're they have the app and they're constantly going in there because the grades are live and checking. Um, I yeah. I really want to hear more about what plan we can come up with um, at the next BPI meeting around progress. Yeah, I don't think that'll be a problem. And I think we have our expanded capability now with Canvas as well, because it's um, we did incorporate grade pass back. Uh, so we might even be able to set up better alert systems within Canvas and then uh, provide, I think, our backpack, which is a new tool we're utilizing in Infinite Campus, might give us this capability. So I'll get back to you, I promise. Um, all right, so gentlemen, Efrad and Aditya, please don't get too excited about this bell schedule um, but this is the latest iteration that has been discussed about the high school now in an ideal world i certainly understand that our high school students would love for high school to begin at 10 a.m or 9 a.m even uh, typically the high school day begins at 7 21 we did push it back to 8 a.m here please keep in mind there are re there are significant challenges uh, and intricacies to a high school schedule for example, ninth graders that come up to the high school to access some of their curriculum, uh, students who go to tech school, students who go to work study, students who leave school early to go to work um, or have a gifted mentorship out in the community. So while it may be ideal to start at nine or 10, uh, we would be very limited with our ability to access the programming at North Monco, to align with our middle schools, and then of course our middle schools, if we're talking like that, reciprocity here our middle schools have some elementary students who come up to them to access curriculum at the middle school um, so there there does need to be an alignment but right now what we're thinking is uh, 40 minutes of synchronous time whether that is uh, similar to the middle school discussion whether that is just a 10 15 minute conversation with the full class to begin and then smaller groups and group work and assignments um, and then coming back at the end of the period Certainly there is autonomy for the art of teaching within each period, uh, but this is kind of your first period begins at 8 a.m. Um, that class lasts for, we'll say 40 minutes, and then your passing time. Um, so the conversations I've had with some teachers at the secondary level, uh, thinking like 30 minutes of instruction with time for support, um, getting started on your assignment, working through those project-based assessments as Mrs. G mentioned earlier, but just a framework here being roughly 40 minutes with a five minute break in between. And then again, you'll see over an hour break in the middle of the day. And this ne almost never happens in the high school um, where you can have everybody off at the same time. So students have the opportunity to go get support. Um, they have the opportunity um, to work in small groups, to make up assignments. And they also have a period in here in which they're scheduled for lunch. So maybe Efrad has fourth lunch, Aditya has fifth lunch. Uh, they could, in theory, Ifrad with having fourth lunch could have from 10.15 to noon uh, where he can take lunch, he can do schoolwork, uh, he can collaborate with friends, work in small groups, uh, but there is flexibility in here. So this is not, when you look at it initially, it is not eight to three synchronous instruction. Uh, there are significant chunks in there. And students will have the opportunity to get support, work with friends, um, and even have some other uh, innovative opportunities. I'm already thinking about like science labs when uh, you know your science teacher could do a demonstration if they chose during that break because everybody's off at the same time in the whole school. Um, so that's the thinking right there and in talking to some of the teachers I think they thought that was um, really great that they would have that that buffer in there to kind of work with kids um, and take a step back. So again we still have some things to iron out um, we're still, and I know many of the questions that I received and the board received had to do with North Monco, our technical career center. Um, we're still working with North Monco because keep in mind, they work with five other districts. Uh, so they they really have to try to align things here and which districts are virtual, which districts are in-person or hybrid. Um, I believe most of the districts that feed into the tech school are virtual at this point, aside for one or two. 
Um, so we're still working with them. I can't answer those definitively what their instruction will look like right now and whether or not they'll be allowed to attend North Monco in person, uh, but North Penn virtually, we're still working out those final details. Will there be a time for uh, morning announcements? There's no, I don't see a in time. Yeah, so Mr. Nicholson and I talked about that this morning, Aditya. Um, I know that the, the work day will be a little different for teachers. This isn't their schedule. Um, so there will be some time for some morning activities or a morning publication, whether we utilize M NPTV, do the morning show, uh, still working on that. But we definitely need to have that time and it could be incorporated in that midday time as well. Okay. All right, Mr. Gilmer. And I believe uh, Dr. Arnie is going to help me with this, but I will, I will chime in on behalf of Dr. Rufo um, that for our gifted and special education supports um, that students will be seen virtually and synchronously as indicated in their GIEPs. An enrichment toolkit is currently being developed for our students at each grade level. Um, in terms of special education, services will be delivered synchronously. Uh, guidelines for synchronous, synchronous related services are in development right now. I know they had a, a robust meeting yesterday investigating online evaluation instruments. Uh, we were, had a meeting about this today uh, for our school psychologists and speech therapists so that they can evaluate students virtually. Working on plans for academic support, um, similar to some of the office hours that have previously been discussed and providing support for students in smaller groups. And then in process of contacting families and students with our most significant disabilities, uh, eligible for alternate assessment to explore options for service delivery. Yeah, the only, is there only thing I'm gonna to add to that, Dr. Bauer, is that um, we did um, have a, a very lengthy conversation as a special ed supervisor team yesterday to recognize that, um, you know, IEP means individualized, that, that everybody's support and services are going to meet, need to be unique based on the student's IEP goals. And that uh, it may be a combination of synchronous or asynchronous. It may be, uh, it's all going to be driven by the IEP team and what each student is going to need based on their goals. And we all uh, recognize that it needs to be more robust than it was, uh, you know, uh, come last March. Can I ask a question about evaluations? Um, I would assume that there's a backlog of evaluations based on the fact that we stopped seeing students in person in March and psychologists had um, evaluations that they were, I'm guessing, had postponed. I know that there were certainly other districts that had to do that. If that's the case, um, I would imagine that they are looking at a um, awful weighty task in front of them considering um, they're going to have new evaluations come their way um, students to be identified they're certainly going to still continue to need to be considered in that process do we have <laughs> the staff like have we talked to psychologists about their potential workload and what that means in terms of deadlines and how we can provide them support to make sure that we can address all those evaluations um, in a i am Mr. Pusco, I'm actually, um, my, that's my eight o'clock meeting tomorrow is to facilitate a um, school psychologist uh, department meeting. And one of the goals is to get an update from the department chair, uh, Mrs. Edmonds, on where they currently stand with that. Okay, so I'll just wait to hear. Thank you. Um, also for the special education, like um, me being a former ESL student, I know a lot of ESL students like need help and they go to a separate class. Like, in under normal circumstances, they go to a separate classroom and get help while they're taking assessments. How would we compensate for that in this environment? Yes, that's a great, great, great question, Efrad. Um, we are still uh, planning to utilize our, our ESL or ELD supports. Um, we are also exploring some opportunities, as we discussed earlier with uh, Dr. Santoro, um, to provide evening opportunities for our families to provide more support and uh, office hours beyond a typical instructional day. So we are, we are hoping and planning to be as innovative and creative as we need to be to be able to provide the same type of education for our students, um, and that's all students. Uh, so Ifrad, I appreciate you being an advocate uh, for students, and Aditya too, I, you guys just are keeping me on my toes, I, and I really enjoy it. So um, I know that the uh, Ms. Bowers was in today, 
to discuss ELD and support. So we're on it. We're not there yet, but we are on it. Um, okay, Mr. Gilmer, I think I have one more slide. I'm sure everyone's sick of hearing from me at this point, but just a quick update on school nutrition services. Um, meals will continue to be distributed in the format. And I think I said in the last meeting that our school nutrition services staff has just been absolutely outstanding. I believe there are well over 100,000 meals delivered since March. Um, I don't know the exact number and I should have been prepared with this, but they're going to continue um, and they're working on expanding the menu, which I'm sure is exciting to everyone. But it is important to note that the USDA has not approved universal free meals as they did in March. Um, and that's in the works is my understanding. Um, but if it's not passed, we will follow through with a plan similar to what it looks like in real life, where we have free and reduced lunch. Um, some students who uh, just pay naturally will still have the option to get to uh, our school nutrition options. Um, and we'll be seeking family input as to whether pickup times and locations, because if you recall, we've consolidated since the beginning on where to pick up. Um, so we're, I believe our SNS department is going to reach out to families to see if there's a better way that we can distribute these meals. But I cannot understate uh, how hard these folks have been working, even all through this summer. Okay, Mr. Gilmer, I think that's the last slide for this portion. It is. I couldn't okay. advance anymore. <laughs> okay, very good. So our next uh, agenda item, Mrs. G, do we still have time for more agenda items? <laughs> Yes, we do. I just want to thank all of you for pulling together as, as much information as you could about what virtual might look like. Um, obviously, it's our intention to get kids back um, as, as soon as we can get them back in school and to continue that conversation over the next, um, you know, couple months um, with the recommendation um, from our superintendent, but I, I'm just grateful. I know the hours that you are all putting in and um, very much appreciate it. Anyone who is at the ECS building should go home like soon. <laughs> um, and um, hopefully to home to a place with power, but thank you very much for, for those of you who you know contributed to that. Looking forward to it. Um, and, you know, I think we've all um, echoed that we really want to make sure that professional development is there for the teachers and that we really can do everything that we just said we would do. Um, and the only way that we can do that is just to have those structures in place, the coaches in place, to support the teachers, the professional development, the time for planning over the next month. Um, we just don't want to disappoint our families, our school community, and we want to give the kids the best possible North Penn education we can give them. Alex, like, I think this is a very strong start to this plan. I think it's great that we're trying, that we're endeavoring to do synchronous instruction every day, that we're modeling it in a way that resembles the way work is at least conducted in a classroom between large group, small group, breaking off and doing some independent work or even some small group work, that there's a lot of supports that we're attempting to put in here for families and for students and time in the day so that um, uh, individual concerns can be addressed. I think even the, this, the middle school schedule, staying with the block scheduling in anticipation that at some point we will come back and that we would still want to have these structures in place to ensure student safety and, and staff safety. Um, I'm very impressed. I'm very impressed with what you put out here tonight in terms of um, the direction that we're heading with this program. I definitely echo the sentiments that, you know, a, a strong, you know, professional development for teachers to make sure that they have a high comfort level the families do. Um, but I, I really um, applaud um, all of you for the work that you're doing in such a short period of time. I know this was a very quick turnaround from the decision that was made last week. Um, but strong work. Thank you. I agree wholeheartedly. I think that we have the all-star team of the county, if not the state here in our administrative team. I think that these folks have given everything they had to the plan. And frankly, when the school board had to change the plan, look at what we have already in a very short amount of time after that as well. I also want to note that uh, since the plans until November are essentially set as far as where people will be physically when they're learning, we've had a number of emails and notes from teachers who are simply ecstatic 
that they will now be able to make plans and they can finally dive into what they wanted to do the entire time, which is create a wonderful education for our students. Whether it's in a classroom or virtually, we have so many teachers here in North Penn that want nothing more than to do their absolute best, no matter what comes down the pike. Uh, and the number of teachers that we've heard from uh, that are uh, ready to jump in and do anything from this moment uh, is extraordinary. So I think that we're gonna be in a very good spot come fall, despite all the barriers uh, and despite all the limitations that we have. Um, and I'm excited to bring parents in, include everyone in the conversation as we try to do so quickly in March and April uh, and really make the North Penn educational process a wonderful thing for our students. Again, I think everybody is bought in. I think everybody's ready. And this is certainly the, a wonderful first step towards that. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Um, and while I might have been the, the longest talking individual on here, it's I certainly cannot take the credit. This team and under Dr. Dietrich's leadership, I know he hasn't said much because he's having some uh, connectivity challenges this evening, but um, he has been relentless in this pursuit and we've been tasked with devising this plan and we are doing it and I'm proud of this group. Um, one thing I did fail to mention is we will have a material pickup for our secondary students as well uh, when it comes to textbooks and Hi. resources and kits. Um, I, I failed to mention that. Well, and I'm sorry, that actually made me think of a question, bro, just real quickly. Um, again, anecdotally, my daughter's computer is falling apart. So what are we doing about students who have Chromebook issues? So, uh, go ahead, Dr. Landis. Okay, so we currently have um, swaps available at the high school um, in the bus circle Mondays and Thursdays from 11 to 1. Um, that's going, ongoing all summer long if she ne needs to swap her Chromebook out. And we'll have a plan later this week that we'll start communicating out to parents for those grades who need to get devices, kindergarten uh, will need to get Chromebooks, first grade will turn in their iPads and get Chromebooks. And then we have replacement devices for students in grades 10, 11, and 12. So we'll be communicating with those students as well as they can come and swap out the oldest devices that we have in the district. And information is on the website about when the swap times are like on the digital learning website and our North Penn website, yes. Um, not about the replacements. That will be coming um, probably early next week. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to move on to our... <laughs> so I, I heard uh, in a podcast recently when the host dog started barking it was like this is our world now so uh no harm no foul mrs g to everyone understands we are going to move on to our student update okay so i want to start the student update with the uh, virtual um national student council conference that was held that normally is i think this year was supposed to be in colorado but it was virtual and free for everybody to attend this year and they had various like um, workshops that um, everybody could attend if you signed up for it and figure out new events that you can implement during this pandemic. Also, the Pennsylvania Association of Student Councils will also be going virtual this year, which will be coming up in a couple months. Yeah, um, yeah. so um, the Link Crew, um, Obviously, our incoming sophomores probably caught in the middle of you know a transition, and we want to make sure that it's as uh, robust as possible. So it will be going virtual, the Link Crew program, and um, uh, we're committed to an online format. We're going to make sure that we introduce the same level of vigor that we've always that always the the Link Crew leaders uh, have, and um, we're going to make it as comfortable as possible. Uh, we're going to have you know large group sessions, small group sessions. I really think during these times, it's important to not like fall back, but you know, put even more effort and to make sure that um, we have that sort of like trust building up between the incoming sophomores and um, the juniors and seniors. Um, the home homecoming uh, is in the works of going virtual. Um, we think it's important that to still have a like a collaborative atmosphere, um, and we don't really want to we don't really want to push it off until the spring. Um, it would be nice to have uh, something uh, socially, you know, emotionally uh, good for, their, for our school. And um, 
so yeah, we're gonna have like different spirit days leading up to the homecoming and um, uh, we're gonna be selling t-shirts, um, hashtag stay at homecoming. And um, uh, yeah, that's, that's it. And I think, but this is like one event uh, for one club. And uh, we, had a, we had our SGA meeting today and uh, one student brought up a good point saying that students are seeing other students in other school districts um, you know, going back to school and um, really enjoying that, you know, a larger extent of, you know, socialization and um, more, you know, extracurricular activities. And I was just wondering, is there sort of an encouragement for other clubs, not just the Student Government Association and their homecoming event, but for other clubs to engage virtually and um, to really bring together uh, people? Absolutely. Uh, we actually discussed that in a meeting prior to this from five to six. Um, about ways in which we can get students engaged beyond the academics, uh, including clubs and activities. So that's in the works. And um, I'm looking for adults and our students to have innovative ways to get kids to still engage in school. Um, so very insightful again. Thank you. Yep, that's it for our student wrap up day. Thank you so much. Um, we have great student reps. I was thinking of uh, nominating one of them to chair at the end of the meeting. They're, we really do have great student reps. Um, so we have um, a couple, a few informational items, other business. Um, it is about 7.56, so um, I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, I would like to try to get through a couple more because I think they can be kind of quick updates. Um, and in case any Inglewood families are listening, I want to make sure that everyone's aware. So we'll try to get through um, the Ingle. We'll start with Inglewood. Um, and then um, we may move to social emotional. Dr. Bauer, we'll see after the next. I know Mr. Galante is on the call for that. So um, we'll start with uh, Inglewood first. Okay, so uh, just a quick update. Uh, when we had our boundary realignment approval um, by the school board in February, uh, after that meeting, I then informed the parents uh, that would be leaving Inglewood um, and going to a new school for the following year um, of, of what happened with the plan and also uh, seeking their acknowledgement that they were aware that this was happening and they actually sign off on the form and they indicate, yes, they're fully aware. In addition to that, you know, asking parents of um, the students going into fifth and going into sixth grade if they would like to remain at Inglewood. So we also had that come back so that we could start to work up our classes and work up our numbers. So all that information came in. Um, also included in that packet, I shared with Inglewood families about our transition plan that we were doing in the spring, which is an informational night where parents would have had an opportunity to go to the new school, visit with the principal, some key staff members, and then later on in early June, where students would actually come in and tour the building um, and meet key staff. And then due to the pandemic, we had to put all of those um, plans on hold. Um, and as you know, it's been a moving target since then. So about mid-July, uh, maybe earlier than that, meeting with the principals, as we were watching how things were evolving. Um, I had the principals reach out, um, Dr. Bowen and also Mr. Bayshaw, to the Inglewood students that would be transitioning to um, their new schools and offering a welcoming and asking them if they would like to come for a tour just to get an, air, an idea of what the building looks like, get to meet the new principal, get to meet the counselor. At least there's some semblance of this is my new home as a child going to my next elementary school. So um, that did occur. We had some nice turnout of parent responses. Um, and so the tours were actually this week. Uh, Gwyneth Square was starting actually today to do some tours today, tomorrow, and Thursday. Um, but due to the weather this morning that it was kind of bad, um, Mr. Bayshaw rescheduled those tours for later in the week. Um, so they will, be, they will be occurring. And then Nash will have their tours the following week. So we will be following socially distanced guidelines. They're in small groups of 10, um, parent and child, uh, walking through the building, just getting a sense of what the school is like. And then also the principals have just a general informational packet about the school. Um, so, you know, we, you know, it's unfortunate that we were in the times that we were in that we couldn't carry out our normal plan. Um, I've done this numerous times um, and it's always been very successful, but our next step is to make sure that the kids have those virtual meetings with their teachers before school starts so that they are welcomed into the school communities. Um, and then hopefully, you know, we can continue to move forward. 
Uh, the other piece is that uh, Mrs. Slavely, uh, as the students finished after school, she did something with all the students leaving Inglewood, going to their new buildings, and it was like a farewell virtual um, little slideshow they did, and they had certificates for the kids, and they had, you know, just recognition of them. So we wanted to make sure that we did put closure on them, um, you know, in Timberwolf pride coming from Inglewood. So um, Mrs. Slavely did a nice job as the kids were exiting the year. And then hopefully, you know, through these tours over the next two weeks, um, I, I think the kids will be just excited just to know, hey, this is my new home. Can I ask uh, just one follow-up? Yes. Uh, when we were expecting a regular rollout to the school year, there was a consideration to put the students who were being transferred in the same class. And again, in anticipation of a return at some point, are we still considering doing that for those students? Absolutely. And working with the principals dil diligently going through, making sure that we had every student accounted for that was going to the new school. Um, I'm very uh, detail oriented. So we made sure we didn't miss any child. We talked about student groupings and actually putting students together. Um, and then a lot of parents have been reaching out to the principals, which is, has, has been awesome over the summer, just connecting with them. So that was a priority for us to make sure that we group the students together. Great, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, thank you, Dr. Santora. We are gonna move on to the equity update. Okay, um, so first I just want to um, just quickly say um, how much I appreciate everyone's support tonight in adopting the new novels. And Mrs. Early and I really just want to thank, um, or say a special thank you to the department chairs, the teachers, um, co-teachers, administration, everybody who was involved in that process. Um, as far as the equity update, um, this will be quick. Um, we'll have a more detailed plan in September, but I just wanted to share some things that have occurred over the summer. Um, we had some support staff training over the summer in cultural proficiency, and uh, several administrators and teacher leaders came together. Um, a lot of them were from our uh, cultural proficiency executive committee, and we created uh, Google Classrooms with the help of our learning coaches, and through that we facilitated um, over 500 uh, support staff, some from food services, transportation, facilities, and some of our secretaries at the ESC, but also some of our elementary building secretaries participated. Um, and that was really um, a great training for them. It was about seven weeks, and they were really um, engaged in that process. Um, we also had a parent panel over the summer, and we met with just any interested parents who wanted to, you know, who reached out um, over the summer and wanted to know more about, you know, some of our equity work and especially after, um, you know, this George Floyd incident this summer. And so we shared our goals, um, some of our action items and steps, things that we have been working on. And we also talked with them about how they could get involved and um, support our cadres at the building levels. Um, we also, a few of us, um, Dr. Dieg and Mr. Taylor, um, we also facilitated and Mrs. Carter participated as well. Um, so we met with some student ambassadors. That's the group that we worked with last year and they're high school students. Um, we partnered with Norristown School District. So they had an administrator on the call um, as well as a teacher. And we talked to the students about um, social justice, how they can be empowered. Um, we talked about mental health um, and just, you know, how we can better help them um, at school with what we're trying to do um, as we support all of our students. Um, and that was a really great uh, meeting. We're also um, starting a book study and um, we've ordered two books. One is called We Can't Teach What We Don't Know. The other is called Not Light But Fire. Um, one is about culturally responsive instruction, and that's one of our goals in making sure that our teachers are culturally responsive in their teaching. And the other is about having courageous conversations. Um, we actually ordered enough books for all of the school board members because um, I know many of you are interested in joining us in reading, so your books are here in my office um, whenever you'd like to pick them up or let me know how I can get them to you. Um, and also we are continuing to work on cultural proficiency plans throughout the year and how we can carve out more PD time for our teachers as well as our administrators. And the last thing I wanted to mention is at the high school, 
there are some, um, some outreach for AP students so that we can figure out how can we get more students into our um, AP courses and with support. Um, so you know that our data has really shown that a lot of um, our students of color are in lower level courses. Um, they're not always in the gifted programs and they certainly um, seem to, not certainly, they do um, have more um, suspensions and things like that around discipline. So there's definitely a disproportionality there and we are working to see how we can, you know, look at students who would be able to um, participate in AP courses. And again, just making sure that, you know, they're supported through that. Um, so that's something else that, you know, we are all working on. So just wanted to mention some of those things so that you had a quick update. And like I said, um, plan to share more with you um, in September. Thank you, Dr. Waters. Um, appreciate the work that you continue to do with um, with the, your entire department and working K to 12 on the work around equity. And I think this just shows that despite the fact that we are in a pandemic and a lot of other things are going on, that the work around equity and our comprehensive goals still continue. So thank you very much for that. Any questions from the committee? Okay, so we will move on to social emotional well-being. Um, if, if committee members have any questions regarding Inglewood or um, the equity information, then you can always, of course, um, have some time to process and follow up with um, Dr. Waters um, or Dr. Lindor. Social emotional well-being. Mr. Galante, is that who? It is. Yes. Thank you, Mrs. G. Can everybody hear me? We can. Okay, great. Good evening, everybody. And thanks so much for the time that I've been provided this evening. Um, I wanted to just take some time tonight to hit some highlights about some of the things that we're looking to do to support our family, students and their families uh, in the upcoming school year as we start the year in a virtual setting. Uh, clearly, when we went back uh, into the spring months and had discussions with families and people in the district, uh, the surveys that we've done over the last few months, a, a critical thing uh, happening with our families is the concern for the social, emotional well-being of our students, their families, the mental health of our students. And uh, it was such a, such a, a um, difficult task in the spring to continue to provide good, solid support in those areas. Uh, so we are we're excited tonight. I'm excited to be able to share with you some, some uh, new ideas that we have to do that. Um, but I want to start by saying that we have outstanding guidance counselors in the school district for, at all levels, elementary, middle, and high school. And they are working tirelessly over the summer, uh, certainly last spring, but also over the summer, to uh, come up with innovative ways to continue to meet the needs of their kids. Uh, they're excited to use Canvas this year um, to continue outreach to families, uh, to, use, to use Canvas in the individual counseling sessions that they, they will continue to hold. Uh, to participate in, in group uh, counseling sessions as well. Um, and they're going to also participate, as uh, Betty mentioned earlier, with the social emotional learning curriculum uh, that we have at the elementary, middle, and high school that will support that effort. Um, our counselors will continue to sit in child study meetings at the middle and high school levels, as well as the RTI meetings at the elementary levels, SAP teams, um, many, many things that they're doing, providing resources to families uh, to support kids and, and, their, and their families uh, with mental health and social emotional well-being. So I just wanted to uh, just say that our, we are in great shape with our counsel, counseling staff. Now, some of the things I want to talk to you about tonight are some new ideas um, to, I'm just going to hit some highlights here of uh, what we have in mind for the upcoming school year. Betty mentioned the social emotional curriculum at the elementary level uh, with responsive classroom in kindergarten and second step uh, in grades one through six. Those are developmentally appropriate programs for kids. They uh, will help in creating uh, communities and, and relationships for, for students uh, with their teachers and, and the adults in their lives and their schools uh, so that we can keep tabs on students in their lives in the virtual world. That was one of the things that uh, was a struggle as we uh, were, you know, uh, 
left school in March that it was, it was uh, a challenge to continue to keep track of kids. So these, uh, the, the curriculum will allow for classroom meetings on a daily and weekly basis uh, so students can continue to create uh, connections with their teachers and with them amongst themselves uh, to cr create the community uh, environment that we would have had we been in school. The same uh, approach will be taken at the middle and high schools where we are developing curriculum uh, for so social emotional learning as well. Dr. Sarah Radigan at the high school level has really led the charge with that. Their program is 100% in place. It will take place during uh, nighttime as Dr. Bauer went through our schedule this evening. There are pockets of time within those uh, uh, schedules each day to, to have these meetings uh, to, to conduct the, this curriculum. Um, so that uh, it's an important thing that will happen probably in the beginning of the school year, we're looking at doing it regularly. And then as we progress, uh, perhaps once a week, each uh, month we'll have a separate theme that we'll be focused on um, to create continuity and common language amongst uh, our, our students. Um, and the same thing will be done at the middle school level. That curriculum is still being developed and we're using Dr. Radigan's format as a guide there. Um, so that's a, it's a really exciting program uh, that will allow us again to create continuity and uh, amongst our, our students to investigate different themes, um, uh, to uh, have kids talk about common themes and ideas on their minds, uh, you know, such as empathy, kindness, team building, uh, restorative practices, uh, equity, et cetera. So uh, we'll give students the opportunity to speak to those, those different topics. So um, just a, Mr. Valente, I, I would love to he have Dr. Radigan come back maybe in October and provide us additional information on how that is going. Um, I, I just think, well, one, I know Dr. Radigan is uh, fantastic, and I'm sure it's, it's going to um, go really well, but it's really unique, and um, especially at the middle and high school level. Um, and I think it's important work, so I'd love to have her come back once you've kind of got it rolling and see and report on kind of how that is. And then okay. Dr. Santoro might be able to help answer this or talk a little more about this. Second step, as I understand it, is definitely a program curriculum which you are teaching about things. You are teaching kids about empathy, and, and you are teaching kids about problem solving or conflict or that kind of thing. Whereas responsive classroom is um, the, the um, teacher actually having structures in place in the classroom to facilitate building community and relationships. So that's how I see the difference between the two. Would that be how you would describe it, Dr. Santoro? Am I accurate? Yeah. I'm I, familiar with second step, so that's why I'm asking. Right. I would agree. It's more the responsive classroom where the teacher is building the community, uh, the way the teacher designs her lessons that are engaging for students. And it really is where kids are getting to know each other and actually the way they are interacting with each other. And I give the example that when we do morning meeting in kindergarten, students will turn to their neighbor. They actually greet each person by name. So students really get, get to really build that sense of, you know, this is my classmate as opposed to before where sometimes kids could go midway through the year to the end of the year and they didn't even know all the kids in the class. So it's very explicit teaching, but it's building that, it's very intentional with building that classroom community. And you're, and you're correct. Second step is more on topic of, you know, how do I problem solve? Um, how do I resolve conflict when, when I'm outside on the playground? Specific so, lessons like that. So my question is, um, and is Mr. Galante or Dr. Santoro, either one of can answer this. I noticed that there was a, a, meet, a class meeting in the schedule for K to six. I did not necessarily say morning meeting, but a class meeting. And I guess my question specifically is, are we looking to put the, the structures of response classroom as you stated them, Dr. Santoro, reading with a name, learning about each other, building community. Are we looking to put those in place K to five or K to six? Um, I just I just think that right now more than ever, yes, we need the kids to be taught about empathy and sharing and problem solving, but 
but we really need them to be able to build community with this new group of students and teachers that they may know a few people, but they may not. Um, and so I'm just wondering if we're looking to, I saw a class meeting in the schedule. Are we looking to put some of those structures K to six in place? Because class meeting, some might be, here's my math message. Hi kids, we're gonna start our day. Let's solve this problem and then move into instruction. Whereas responsive classroom, it's taking the time for everyone to have an opportunity to share something. There's a sharing part of the morning meeting. So I'm just wondering which of those we're, what path we're headed down. Well, that's correct. We're trying to phase it into first grade. Um, I did mention it a little bit earlier where we have Marisa Neeson, who's one of our trainers, and she's working with some of the school teams to actually start implementing that in first grade. So we would like to phase it in for this year, and we would like to continue to see that phased in because we, we know that it works well. Um, I also wanted to mention that we have a core team of about 22 people that have been trained that are our trainers that can go out and support the teachers. They did that training last year and then they went to another level training this summer, um, taking on tier two and tier three of responsive classroom. So yes, our intention is we would like to see that continue at the elementary level and we are working to phase it into to some of our first grade classrooms. Do you think that we have the capacity to at least phase in morning meetings, like at least provide the structures of morning meetings, even the information right. of, how, of how a morning meeting should go beyond first grade this year. I just, I just think the kids, and, the kids and the teachers need a structure by which they can really start to build community early on, even though you're going to be virtual. So are we looking at that as part of the class meeting time? Well, it is something that we're exploring right now. And I want to be mindful that we also have second step coming in that we've trained all of our teachers in as well. So that's a piece of that explicit on a, an explicit topic. But we do want to phase in the model of doing classroom meeting, doing the, how do you conduct the classroom meeting? How do you do a greeting? So that's something that is that we are talking about right now. And I know, like I said, I do have a handful of schools that have already jumped on board and arranged time with Marisa to, to have her, the staff trained in first grade. But I really would want to work that up a little bit more, but I agree with you 100% that I think if we at least set the structure of this is how to run the class meeting and send that out to teachers, they can then um, you know pick up with that. Just to click kind of like a brief overview of how you should run your right. class meeting. Right, I, I just think in this environment more than ever, you're going to have little faces that are going to be coming in front of that screen and they've never even met the person. And I know our teachers are great at connecting. Um, I don't want to put necessarily more on their plate of learning all of responsive classroom, but at least providing them with the structure of what this could look like might be helpful to them. Right. Um, exactly. So. And a lot of our counselors, you know, they sat on the team, the kindergarten uh, steering committee when we were looking at social emotional. So a lot of them have a responsive classroom training too. So, so they um, could even maybe pop in and do a morning meeting in some of the other classrooms right. in the first month or so of school. I'd like to see us, um, and this is, I guess, for Mr. Galante, see us be proactive. Um, in, I know our, our counselors are great at triaging, right? Like all of the things coming their way. Um, I also want us to be able to provide them with the time to be proactive and supporting the teachers with some of the things that you're gonna see. So I think you're gonna have a lot of kids that are coming back from the summer and it's been a hard summer. We did have a, a caller who kind of spoke to that, um, that there are, we do need to be concerned about their mental health, right? Um, so really wanting to see how we can be proactive in supporting that. So Mrs. I, 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 I would say to you that I, there's a, there is a strong interest among all of the teachers in meetings this summer to invest in class time, a small portion of class time uh, in community building across the board, not just at the elementary level with those, those programs, but just in general, uh, because the recognition is that kids are coming back in after having left abruptly under, um, uh, you know, adverse circumstances in the spring and they're coming back in over some some trying circumstances this summer. So community building is on the minds of, of all the teachers at all at all levels. Um, the less the, the classroom meetings, nighttime, pen time, uh, the time periods that they have at the elementary levels will we'll build community, will also allow a smaller group of students to build a connection with their teacher 
uh, which is good for, good for um, for both parties. Uh, so I think that, as I'm saying, that there is a, there is a desire among staff to really emphasize the community building and, and the connection building. Uh, we're going to try to do it from the um, comprehensive standpoint with curriculum, but also embed that idea throughout the day, period by period. Uh, so we, you know we have a, a community uh, building at large uh, throughout the day. So I think you'll I think you'll be uh, pleased with that, and I, I'd be happy to come back in October with Dr. Radigan to let you know how it's all going as well. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was the development of a mental health mobile crisis response team. Um, it is a group of counselors who are trained in the district, uh, many of whom are already have been trained already and we're going to be able to train some more uh, late summer, early fall. It will work in conjunction with the Montgomery County Crisis Unit. And basically what it will allow us to do uh, will be to provide a more expedient response to students who are in, in crisis uh, to get them the help that they need. Oftentimes, they're through no through no one's fault. Uh, there there can be delay when we uh, have to rely on the, on the county. So our t our counselors uh, professionals are trained in, uh, in in how to respond in the immediate moment and to provide uh, interventions for for students and their families and get them the help that they need. Uh, so it's immediate support for the students, and, and we feel that this will be a great asset to our families um, in the virtual world so that we can ensure that everyone has the support that they need as you know kids uh, go through crisis and it spills into the more mental health side of things. Uh, so we feel that that's gonna be a big help to, to um, our mental health program as well. Bob, you can go to the next slide, please. We continue to contract with Lakeside and Merikee. I'm excited to tell everyone that we will have on both sides, both Lakeside and Merikee contracts will allow for more counselors uh, for in each contract, which will obviously help. They'll provide us with uh, individual and group counseling uh, at, in all of our buildings, um, even in the virtual setting. So that, that's a, uh, another uh, strong component of what we're trying to provide. Uh, an, another twist here is that Lakeside, we're, we're confident that uh, there's a strong potential for Lakeside to be able to provide us with uh, a social work component in addition to the mental health side of things. So uh, the board meeting last week, the, the one parent um, who was so eloquent in describing her, her um, inability to navigate the, the system to get child care, this is something that a social worker would be very adept in. Uh, so there's a critical need for that. So the Lakeside counselors are all LSWs. So in addition to being able to provide counseling services, they can provide um, social work services as well. So we're excited about that as a, as a support. Uh, we're going to, uh, next item would be uh, to expand our RISE program at Northbridge, which I oversee as well. Uh, the RISE program uh, is designed to meet the needs of students with mental health issues primarily uh, depression and anxiety. Um, we are going to be working with our counselors at the secondary level in the coming weeks here to identify students um, who would have, from the spring, spring on have, had, have been compromised uh, to the extent that we wanna start them in a smaller environment with more access to counselors. So it's going to be an invitation once students are identified uh, it would be an invitation and outreach to their families to see if they would like to participate. Uh, and, and we feel like we can, we can really populate our program immediately as opposed to um, filling it up as the year goes on as students uh, you know, are experiencing crisis in the moment. Uh, we feel there, there's enough need that we, that we can start the school year with, with the program pretty much filled up. So we're, we're excited about that as well. Uh, I was asked to talk about faculty, faculty and staff wellness, in addition to students and their families. Also a critical need, our, our, our teachers and staff members are going through their own uh, emotional uh, issues and, and mental health issues. Uh, so there are many, many resources available to them. Um, professional development opportunities, uh, as I said, many resources that we have uh, made available to them. EAP, um, is, you know, employee assistance program is in place and just the general support at the building level from the principals and the, and the administration um, who are all very in tune with their staffs 
and uh, you know the, the folks in, in their buildings at all levels and, and what uh, supports they need. So, um, but that is something that we're going to stress with, with uh, building level administration at the outset of the year, how best to meet the needs of the, the, their staff members. So those are the things that we have in mind to start the school year in, in the virtual setting uh, to, to promote uh, mental health and, and uh, well-being of everyone, all students and faculty. Thank you, Mr. Galante. I appreciate, again, the detail um, and, the in, and all the information um, from your department. Are there any questions from the committee? No questions, but thank you, Mr. Galante. It's a very comprehensive plan that we have moving forward. Um, it does stress the importance that we do put on, on student and faculty mental health, um, not just during the pandemic, but, um, you know, as a key component of what we do as a district for the students um, and the community that we serve. So thank you for that work. Again, we, we really have to empower public education to keep doing what they were doing in the first place, and that's taking care of kids and families. And I think this is a good plan moving forward. Looking forward to see uh, what happens and how we can respond to more needs as we inevitably see more needs come up in this fall. Thank you. You. I know Dr. Russo is not on this call, but um, you know I think our agenda, as I was talking to her um, last week, is reflective of our commitment as a district to meeting the needs of students and families. So when I, you know, look at social emotional, the social emotional well-being of our families and our staff, what we need to do to have a robust program for virtual learning, the work that we're doing around equity. Uh, an update on our lunch program and our plans there, um, everything that Mr. Galante just described, um, and um, the amazing work that Dr. Santuro and Dr. Bauer are doing at the elementary and secondary level to plan instruction. I think this is just um, reflective of our commitment to a quality education, whether it's virtual or not. Again, always our hope to get things back to in-person. <laughs> as soon as possible. Um, that's what public education is. We do in person better than anyone else. Um, but, um, you know, we are going to make lemonade out of lemons and um, we're going to have a, a great start to the year. Um, I know that we are. So with that, I'm looking at... I just quickly ask um, either Dr. Santoro or Dr. Bauer, um, the presentation tonight, is that going to be available on the website for the folks that weren't able to see so they can share links or... Um... Yes. I uh, already spoke with Mr. Gilmer and Ms. Liberoski about a communication uh, coming out in the next day or two regarding all of this. Mm -hmm. And um, certainly one of the questions I've already received since my presentation was a deadline for requesting asynchronous. Uh, so we'll have all that information and a link to this uh, presentation in that communication. Absolutely. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm looking for a summary of agenda items. It looks like the only thing that we have going to um, action would be the adoption of the novels. Is that what you see, Dr. Bauer, as well? That's okay. correct. That is the only uh, action item, moving to the action agenda. Okay, the next um, regularly scheduled education curriculum and instruction committee meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, September 1st at 6 p.m. And um, if there is no other business, um, can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Moved. All right, meeting adjourned. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.